everybody. Um, it's Maris here, Maris Wicks. I am a Boston area cartoonist, writer, drawer of comics, um, and welcome to one of our drawing sessions where y'all get to draw with me um, in my living room, uh, or sorry, dining room, wherever the heck I am, I don't know anymore. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> uh, we're gonna be doodling animals that I, I know we think about the aquarium, we think about ocean animals, but I wanted to talk about, I was like racking my brain, I'm like, how can we connect people with animals that might be closest to their backyard, but that still depend on water? And I started thinking about ponds, because that was the favorite place that I went when I was a kid. Uh, the development behind my house had a, a rainwater retention pond where all the rainwater would drain off, and uh, it was a great place to watch frogs and turtles and see birds eat those frogs sometimes. Anyways, so we're going to be talking about pond life today. Um, this was one of my favorite nature guides when I was a kid, um, and I'm, I'm showing you my nature guides just because uh, all the things we're going to be drawing today, I looked at and researched and looked at photo references. This is one of my favorite nature guides right now. If you live in New England and you want just like, it's not too big, fits in a backpack, uh, this kind of covers all different uh, flowers and even fish, like it goes, goes through um, saltwater stuff. So these are what I have kind of with me, helping me inform my drawings. Uh, you do not need to be an artist to participate today, although in my opinion, all people are artists. Um, all you need is a pencil and a piece of paper. Um, since I'm sharing my drawings on the screen, my pencil and paper look a little weird. I have a tablet and a stylus, and I'm going to be drawing in Photoshop. I prefer to draw on paper, but it's easier for me to share my drawings with you this way. Uh, so that's what I'm doing. Um, I know when this drops, it won't be live, but if you have any questions, you can totally put them in the comments and I'll look and I'll see if I can answer any of those. Um, but yeah, let's, let's draw some pond animals. So I'm gonna share my screen. Boop. Boop. Has to come with side effects. And uh, yeah, so uh, if you've followed along with these videos before, you know I like to think about kind of big ideas before we start. So I'm going to talk about a couple things when we draw these animals. It's the things I like to focus on. Um, so body shape of the animal, um, fins or limbs, what their mouth looks like, their eyes, any patterns or shapes they might have on their body, and behavior. And behavior is kind of the funny one because you're not really going to get too much information about animal behavior in the field guides. But if you go to a pond and you hang out for a while and watch animals there, you might learn some things about animal behavior just by observing animals in their habitat. Um, if you don't have the ability to go do that, that's totally fine. I actually look up lots of stuff on YouTube and it's just like, you know, I'll Google like frog jumping and I can find video footage of a frog jumping and that will help me figure out what a cartoon version of that might look like. Um, so, Ponds. I'm going to put my name down the bottom here too. You can find out more information about me and what I do uh, on social media and my website. So we're going to start with an insect, the green darner, which is uh, the largest dragonfly in uh, northeastern U.S. Most of these animals are going to be uh, local to the northeastern U.S., but a lot of them can be found all over North America. So the green darner gets its name from a darning needle, which I had to look up. It's a really big needle that's used to sew up like sweaters and uh, blankets that are made out of wool and things. So uh, sometimes the animals have names that we don't really get what those names are from, but uh, it's kind of a fun story to learn about animals' names because they can be very different and sometimes they go back hundreds of years. So with our green darner, um, I'm gonna be doing this just in uh, black and white today. You feel free to add color later. Um, dragonfly bodies. So practice this long bit. And again, I'm kind of thinking about body shape. And then we've got an oval up here and kind of another oval for their head. Uh, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Enhance. Uh, I'm gonna go right to eyes, just because if you've seen a dragonfly before, they have quite large eyes. Um, so two circles, oops, a little bit of a lag on there. Two circles. And we'll give them some pupils. Now this is, I told you I was a cartoonist. So sometimes what I do is I, um, I make real life things a little bit more abstract. Um, so I'm gonna give this dragonfly really cartoony eyes. It 
they don't always look like that in, in real life. They don't have one pupil like us. They have compound eyes. So it's basically like a whole bunch of little tiny eyes working together to help make images. But I like to be cartoony. So I've got to get this friend some wings. So on a dragonfly's body, there's kind of like, or at least on the green, bar, green darner's body, they've got kind of the two areas where the wings are attached and they have four wings, two on either side. So let's give this friend some nice little wings. One, two, and their wings are kind of like teardrop shapes. Um, again, I really like to think about what, what shapes animals are made out of, um, just because that's, that's something that's always really helped me draw um, these animals. Now, we're gonna have this dragonfly holding onto a, a long leaf because it just seems like the right thing to do so we can showcase some legs. Um, so let's get some little legs. They've got little tiny, tiny hooks at the end of their legs for holding on to stuff. Another set of legs. Dragonflies are insects, so we've got uh, two sets of three legs each for a total of six legs. I, I try. I try with my math. Um, sometimes when my artist brain gets going, my math brain suffers a little bit. I know they're not completely divided. They're, they're sometimes intertwined, but yeah, we can give this friend a nice big stalk of maybe like a cattail or nice long, nice long bit of grass. And again, this is kind of where the behavior part comes in too, where I'm like, okay, it's not just a dragonfly, it's interacting with its habitat. So, oh, and they also have like little segments on their back part. So I'm just gonna give them that. Yeah, my wings are a little lopsided, but you know what, that's okay. If at any point you need to, you can erase. Um, erasing is just important as drawing. So don't think about it as uh, messing up. Think about it as you're taking away and just adding. And that's how I like to think about erasing, just because it's like, it's, it's just as important part of drawing as the actual making the marks part. Um, it's a journey. The whole point of this is just to have fun. Um, Sometimes I, the other point is to make myself laugh. I sometimes get myself giggling pretty hard uh, when I draw animals that look too silly or I don't know, maybe just silly enough. Um, so back to behavior. I'm assuming a lot of you have seen dragonflies fly. I love watching them fly. I love that they hover. Um, one of my favorite things to do is watch them over a pond or a lake at dusk. These friends like to eat insects. They're really good at eating mosquitoes. So thank you, dragonflies. And they just like, like they, they're like little X-wings just flying around, like eating all sorts of little asteroids. No, that doesn't really work for my, for, for my bad analogy, but they're really good at catching and eating bugs. So I want to draw a dragonfly from the side and we're going to, we're going to make it go fast. So uh, pretty, pretty similar from the side, actually. So we've got our little oval. We've got our long kind of stick part for the back and we've got our another oval and maybe since we're seeing it from the side we only see one eye the other eye is is blocked Let's zoom in a little bit they're just such cool cool insects got laser focus because we're going to catch some bugs and this is one of the cool things i when i looked at pictures of dragonflies earlier they kind of tuck up their 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 legs kind of like how landing gear goes up into a plane so i I think I've got it right where they, I've got a little bit of a cheat sheet with me because um, I make notes for stuff like this. Um, but tuck them up just like that. So you might not actually see their legs if you're drawing them um, flying like this. We've got our back part and let's get our, our wings. I don't know what like the right sound effect would be for them. I mean, I feel like it would just probably sound like me making fart noises. I feel like when when they fly by, it's just kind of just like. So again, sounds like a fart noise. I can't I can't really do dragonfly super well. Um, but that's another thing that I do think about when I'm drawing animals is uh, are there any? You know what? I'm gonna draw lines. I'm gonna just. This is one of the fun parts about working digitally is I don't have to erase them. I could just go right back. I'm gonna make those wings go like that. So I don't think I can nail the sound effects for this friend, but I think what we can do is some motion lines. Um, so in, I'm gonna say cartooning, there are some visual things that you can do that might look weird, but we kind of accept them as, as things. So motion lines are one of them. So I wanna have lines on either side to show that the wings are moving like that. And it's kind of a way to make a, a, a non-moving drawing have a little bit of movement. 
And then the other one is speed lines, another type of motion lines. I want to show what direction this dragonfly is going in. So I'm going to draw some straight, well, straight as I can, straight lines coming off the back of this dragonfly. Maybe they're not all going straight. Maybe they're going a little bit towards lines on there. And I think we need to draw a mosquito that's about to get eaten. So they're pretty small. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. I'm gonna lock eyes. We'll make this mosquito. That's a pretty big mosquito, but that's just a little bit. Wow. One, two, three. I don't remember what mosquito wings look like. I didn't do my research on mosquitoes. I didn't think I was going to be drawing a mosquito today. And you know what? Maybe, maybe we draw a little, <laughs> a little mouth with the tongue sticking out. No, <laughs> this again. This is where the cartooning gets kind of, kind of silly. Um, but yeah. So we've got animal animal interaction. Now my favorite dragonfly thing. And I feel like I didn't learn this until I was adult, but I didn't know what baby dragonflies look like. Um, dragonflies go through metamorphosis. So they start out and as, as, as an egg, they hatch into a nymph or a naiad, uh, which doesn't have wings, but it lives underwater. And then that naiad climbs out of the water and attaches to a rock or to a dock or to a, a plant on the edge of the water. And then they hatch out of the back of that and they're a dragonfly. Um, so I wanted to draw one of their larval forms before we before we go on, and you can call them naiads or nymphs. Or nymphs. I I feel like I baby baby water dragonfly friends. I don't know. I don't get too caught up in the language unless I'm like writing a paper on something. Um, but I do try and I do try and get it. I do try and get it kind of right. Um, but long story short, there's lots of different names for the same thing, um, especially when you're thinking about nature and animals. And you might have noticed that uh, up in the corner, I've got the name up at the top. Green darner is a common name. Um, and sometimes animals can have lots of different common names depending upon where you live in a country um, or even just a region. And then the name below it is its uh, scientific name. And I just like to put both in case you want to really look up the species um, and see the animal that we drew. Um, so dragonfly nymph. And these are just so wild. I just think they're super cool. So. They have pretty good camouflage, so there's lots of different patterns on their bodies. And I'm drawing the back half kind of like the same way we started with the back half on the dragonfly before. And then we've got, I meant to look this up. There's two things on their back that kind of look like maybe that's where the wings develop, but I'm not sure about that. So don't quote me on it. I need to do a little bit more um, science homework on what our, what our nymph friends look like, but they do have this little like, almost looks like a little backpack on. And then surprise, they still have pretty big eyes. Um, now the dragonfly nymphs, they're underwater, but they still eat um, bugs because I don't know if you know about mosquito life cycles, but they also, their larvae is in the water and then they hatch into their flying blood sucking form. Um, like little tiny vampires. Uh, I'm trying not to have too strong of feelings against mosquitoes. Uh, I do know that though they do play an important role in the food web, um, but I don't like it when they when they vampire me and they suck my blood. So I try my I try my best to avoid mosquito bites, which is a good idea. Then, you know, um, give this friend some eyes. Maybe we'll draw a mosquito larvae for it to eat, and then got to do our legs. So uh, same thing going on. We've got and for legs, a lot of times I'll just draw like little sticks. They've got little hooks at the end holding on to things. Always a good idea um, if you're a little bug friend. And we'll do another little one in the front. Oh, my little creepy body friend. And maybe we'll draw, like I said, we'll draw a little mosquito larva for this friend to eat. The mosquito larva, I don't want to get up and do the actual dance, but when you see them in a pond, like look at like vernal pools and ponds and um, Ideally, if you have in your yard or you're on your balcony, you shouldn't have any standing water because mosquitoes can live in there. So if you have like, you know, if you have a bird bath, make sure you're changing that water. But if you ever see mosquito larvae, they basically look like they're doing this little dance and then like flapping around. So I'll, I'll try my best to do the cartoon version of that. Um, and they look kind of fuzzy and they kind of, you know what, I'm gonna make, one of the other things that you can do in cartoons is if you want to do motion stuff and show that something's moving back and forth, 
you can change the color of the line and make it, it's kind of called ghosting. So you're like making the, the version move. And this, I might not get this one very well, but there's supposed to be a wiggling mosquito larvae in front of this friend and it's going to get eaten, spoilers. Um, so there's our green darners. Um, if I had more time, we'd color them green, but you can, you can do that on your own time. Um, so let's move on to an, uh, an amphibian, amphibian. And when I was laying this out, I didn't mean to, but I kind of laid this out in a way that like almost everything that I draw next could eat the thing before. Um, um, I actually think ponds are a really cool example of like seeing a food web in process. And there's a lot of small things that we're leaving out of the food web. I do a whole separate thing about, you know, water bears and rotifers and fairy shrimp and all this other really tiny stuff at Lindsay Ponds. But I was, I was going about going for charismatic megafauna today. So next up is a bullfrog. Um, you might have heard them before. They got their name because they sound a little bit like a grunting or bellowing bull. So they have kind of like, rawr, rawr. that's my best frog I can do for you today. Um, take my word for it or go to a pond and hear a real one. Um, and they, they sometimes do that in choruses. So imagine just a whole bunch of I don't know, I can't, I mean, I think of the word chorus, I just think of middle school chorus, and I just think of a hundred bullfrogs standing on bleachers, like, oh, oh. Um, but yeah, and the male bullfrog frogs make that sound to attract mates. Um, so we're going to draw some bullfrogs, and I think with bullfrogs, um, I would like to try and go realistic at first, and then see if we can push it a little bit more abstract. So we'll go back to my normal drawing rules where we think about body shape, um, and I was trying to think of their body shape, oh, I need to get this a little darker. Their body shape kind of looks like, a, I don't wanna say football, cause it's not really like a football, it's more angular. Kind of like a uh, hexagon, hexagon, this is a hexagon. I was like, kind of like a rupee from Legend of Zelda. I, I don't mean with the popular culture references today. It's just like where, that's where my brain is at, is like sci-fi and video games today. I can't help it. You think I would have gone with Frogger, but no, uh, I did not. So um, one of the other things I didn't talk about is distinguishing features. So when I cartoon, I sometimes will exaggerate certain features on an animal because those are the parts that we think of the most. So with frogs, we've got, they've got those big honking eyes up on top of their head. So I'll draw, I'll often draw them bigger than they are in real life, but I think that's okay. It's kind of like caricature, right? Um, and you know, I don't need to think about that horrible caricature I had done of myself in middle school. I think my mom got it for me. Sorry, mom. Um, it was embarrassing. I don't want to see all my features exaggerated, but sorry, frogs, we're going to do that to you today. Um, just because Maris says so. So we've got some, get some eyeballs going. One of the things I do love about frogs is that they got like the eyes going in either direction. So we'll have this friend looking great right at you. Mouth. Okay, it's done. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's really hydrodynamic. Um, if you've looked at bullfrogs before, you might notice that there is a circle behind their eye. That's an external eardrum. I think tympanum is the uh, science name for it. Um, male bullfrogs have a tympanum that's bigger than their eyeballs and females have a tympanum that's or ear, like eardrum that's about the same size as their eyeballs and that's one of the ways to tell the difference um female bullfrogs are bigger than the males um that's something that happens sometimes animals of male and female variety are the same size but sometimes there are differences um a lot of times if the like for turtles what we're going to do next the females are larger just because they lay so many eggs so their body needs to be a little bit bigger to accommodate laying eggs um now the other big frog characteristic that I think of is legs. Bullfrogs have really powerful back legs. They're super good jumpers. They can jump 10 times their body length. So I'm gonna pay closer attention to those back legs. Um, and their legs are kind of, I don't wanna say they're weirdly shaped because that's not fair. Frogs probably look at our legs and be like, huh, humans, what's going on there? You can't jump 10 times your body length. So I would say that their legs are interestingly shaped. Um, Whenever I catch myself calling something weird, I try and like check myself to be like, oh, is it weird? Or is it just because it's not like me? And like, that's not fair. So I try and I try and give them credit and say they have really cool shaped legs, um, but there's a lot of bending going on. So I'm, I'm consulting my frog notes as I do this. So it's kind of like drawing a like backwards cartoon S. Um, so I did one letter C facing backwards. My magical power is racing. 
and then one C going the other way. And that's kind of how their, their levees are. And at the end, they have really long toes. And in between those toes are webs. Um, web toes are helpful in an aquatic environment. They help you push the water. Um, if you've ever worn fins before, like diving or snorkeling, you'll notice that they help us swim faster. Um, and I know that people can also have webs between their toes, um, but usually not, they're not big enough to like help us swim faster. Um, Sorry, web toes, folks. Maybe you're a tiny bit faster. Um, and we'll get another leg going on there. Their heels. I'm not actually sure if that's their heel, but parts of their legs touch in the back. This is one of the things where it's really interesting to look at like a frog skeleton and the places that it seems like might be a heel or a knee might not actually be the places that we think just based on how elongated their, their uh, anatomy is in their legs. I was thinking about this with cats the other day. How their, I thought the hip on my cat was the hip part and it turns out it was their knee part. Um, which is why I love just looking at skeletons of animals. It's very fun. So front legs. Uh, front legs don't do a whole bunch. Um, but they've got little front toes. They got 12 four toes in front. They're not webbed for the front legs. Um, but they look like they'd be like, okay at doing push-ups. They're like a little, a little meaty, those little front legs. And I feel like we need a bigger pupil. Maybe pupil on that side. Nope, that looks weird. Not to the frog, just my drawing. Don't worry, frog, you look great. Um, and I feel like I messed up the uh, anatomy a little bit on this one. It maybe should be a little longer. So I'm going to take this frog and we're going to draw it from the front. So this is something I like to do with character design. I'm going to draw a couple guidelines. So that's the top of the eye. The mouth is there. And then the feet. So I'm marking the locations on the sideways drawing. And we're going to take this drawing and look at the frog as if we were looking straight on at the frog. Because they are an animal that I find looks very different from the side versus from the uh, from the front. So, and again, I did look at, uh, I looked at a lot of pictures of frogs before I drew these today. Um, part of my job is kind of like half using my imagination and half using references to help assist my imagination. Um, and it's, it's, you know, there are some artists that just draw like, from their imagination, but that's not to say that they haven't looked at or been inspired by things. Um, but for me, it's really helpful for me to see what something looks like in real life um, and then take that to inspire my drawings. Um, and it's different for all folks, but if you really, if you want to get better at drawing, um, drawing is a technical skill. The more you practice, the better you'll get at it. Um, and a lot of times, strengthening that connection between your brain and your hand drawing from life is something that does strengthen that connection. Um, so being able to look at something in real life or look at a photo and draw it. And you're not going to be doing a super realistic version of it. It's using that uh, reference to inspire how you draw the animal. Like the photo I looked at didn't look like this, but it's still helping. <laughs> this is the point when I laugh about the drawing I'm doing, because I think it's OK if, if, you, if your drawings crack you up. Um, and it's helpful to look at an animal from different perspectives like this because you can learn a little bit more about their anatomy and how they might be posed. So froggy friend, I've got those front legs. I'm using that guideline about where the toes fall on the ground. Front. And the same thing in cartooning, you know, I'm trying to be accurate with how many toes I give this frog, but you've probably watched cartoon shows before and noticed that like even the humans in the cartoon show uh, have three fingers and a thumb instead of four fingers and a thumb. And part of that is because a hand like that is easier to animate. Um, so I try with animal characteristics, like when I draw a shark, I try and draw five gill slits on the side because that's how many they have in real life. There's a couple things I really like to kind of keep, um, keep accurate. But as you'll see when I draw the next frog, um, Jeepers, this frog is really just, who oh boy. And again, like, it's one of those things where we don't necessarily think of seeing frogs this way. Or maybe you do. I guess like we, this is kind of like a very cartoony way to show them poking their head out of the water. But I feel like it is, it is a little challenging to draw an animal front on. I think horses are another example of like, oh, hey, horses are hard to draw no matter what. Um, but drawing a horse from the side, drawing a horse from the front, um, because they have such an elongated face, it, it looks very different. Um, and you can say the same even for people. You know, what we look like from the profile looks very different than what we look like at the front. Um, this little friend, you know, maybe 
Okay, lip on the bottom, give you some nostrils. I don't remember where your nostrils are. Right there. <laughs> and that, there's a frog. So um, an example of abstracting a frog is, so let's, let's draw a circle. Okay, oval, gumdrop shape. Let's put two half circles on top. And already, even if I were to just leave this drawing like this, you might know that that's a frog. Um, so one of the really interesting things about um, drawing an abstraction is there are a lot of things that we kind of collectively, especially if you color this green, you're like, oh, it's a frog. Um, there's a lot of things that we can abstract pretty far, but still recognize as as what they are. So this is this is where kind of uh, abstracting and really letting my imagination take over a little bit, even though it's been inspired by drawing these other frogs. So I'm going to really make those tiny front legs tiny because they don't do a whole lot. They do help to push, but we're going to accentuate the back legs because that's these guys are all about the back legs. One, two, three, four. And again, I'm making sure there's still four toes, but this is a very cartoony, cartoony version of a frog. And this version's not better than the first version and vice versa. Um, they're just different versions. And this is, this is what I like to do is to kind of push myself to think about, you know, how far can I take this frog? Um, or can I be really silly? And, you know, I think about the same frog that we just drew. But sometimes when I go to the pond and it's really hot outside and I see the frogs, there's some of them that are just like hanging out on lily pads, which I thought was just like something that happened in cartoons, but turns out it happens in real life. Uh, it's pretty great. A frog in a lily pad will make my day brighter, even if I'm having the worst day ever. I will just, all I have to do is show me a frog in a lily pad and I'm like, oh, God, you're going so great. Um, maybe one of you out there also feels the same way. Maybe you're like, Maris, what's wrong with you? Um, but really, I just, it's one of those, like, it's like those little things that just make me very happy. Um, and sometimes I feel like the bullfrogs on the lily pad just being like, hey, how's it going? And they've got those long legs. So we're going to give this frog some long legs. Four toes. One, two, three, four. And this frog is, I mean, maybe this frog was calling to some of his lady frog friends, or maybe it's a lady frog. And she's just like, hey, I just laid 20,000 eggs. Got to take a break on the zilly pad. It's a lot of eggs. Um, a lot of animals that live in the water that lay lots of eggs because a lot of them will get eaten and that's part of the food web um, and only a few of them might make it to be adults but it's still filling a really important role so that all the different organisms within that ecosystem and that food web have food to eat. Um, I think about you know lobsters lay like 50,000, 75,000 eggs, cods almost 2 million eggs and again this is going into the salt water but um, I Maybe a little heart. Maybe this frog's really fond of seeing people. It's like, hey, I'm glad that you appreciate that I'm on this lily pad. Because I like being on a lily pad. It's great. Okay. Enough of Maris's silly frogs. Um, but I hope you I hope you get the picture with uh, pushing drawings and that 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 top one, man, is still making me laugh. Um we are going to move along to our next animal. And this is, I think before frogs show up in the pond, I see painted turtles. And it's like really a true sign of like spring and things warming up. And it's like turtles on a log in a pond. It's like the best. So uh, painted turtles are one of the most common turtles that we have in the Northeast. They're also one of the most common turtles in North America. So they're, they're all over. There's four different subspecies. Um, I chose the species, which is an Eastern painted turtle. And that's the one that would be in the New England area. Um, but they all, they all share a lot of characteristics. So I like to think of turtles as kind of like burgers, but with arms and legs sticking out of them. Um, so for your top shell, your carapace, it's kind of like the bun on the burger. And the meat of the burger is the turtle body. I'm just gonna do a suggestion of that. And then the bottom, the bottom bun is the plastron, the bottom of the, um, the bottom of their shell. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about turtle shells in a second, but we'll get the, our, our burger friend happening. Um, so we've got a tail and we've got some legs. Um, I didn't really think beyond the burger analogy. <laughs> Maybe the legs are like little pieces of melty cheese sticking out of our turtle burger. Um, but with their legs, they're, they're bendy, kind of like the letter D. 
got some little toes at the end. You can erase the, the burger buns. And their front legs are kind of interesting. They face, they face kind of forward similarly. Um, and they can, they can rotate their you know, shoulder and hip joints so that they can move their legs. But I mostly think of them sitting on, so they've got some more claws. And they've got claws, but they also have webbed feet, like our frog friend, good for, um, good for swimming. And one of my favorite uh, turtle courtship behavior, and I'm talking a little bit about courtship because it's spring, and it's when a lot of animals mate and have babies. Um, I observed two painted turtles in a pond a couple of years ago, and they were face to face in the water, and they kept taking their claws and just tickling each other's cheeks. And I was like, I have no idea what's going on here. I watched it for like 15 minutes, and I and I went home and I googled like turtles with claws touching each other's faces, and it's a courtship behavior. So they were they were saying like, oh, turned up your face. Um, and I'm, I'm parting a little bit of human on there. I'm anthropomorphizing, anthropomorphizing a little bit, but it's really cool to just like go and observe, to watch animals. Um, and that's part of the reason why I love going to the aquarium because it's like a way to go do that with animals that are from all over the world. Um, but it's also really fun to just do it in your backyard. Uh, it's fun to watch squirrels, chipmunks, birds, sparrows. Um, but it's observing isn't just going and looking once. Observing kind of is like, Observing is like informed watching. Like you're watching with the idea that you wanna like learn a little bit more about what you're watching. Um, so a lot of times you might not see these things that I'm talking about unless you go back to the pond 15, 20, 50 times and you're like, oh, I saw that thing that Maris was talking about. Um, and that's one of the cool things about returning to the same habitat over and over again and getting to know like, oh, that's the, I think that's that same duck. We've got a Canada goose with two white um, circles on its eyebrows, which is a pretty distinguishing feature. Most of them just have black above there. So I've been following that one goose, not actually following it, but like every time I go to the pond, I see that goose and I'm like, hey, what's that goose again? Um, okay, we're gonna get our little turtle face. Oh, what a long neck you have, painted turtle. I think I maybe made it a little too, or not too long, but a little more stretched out. Last John, we're gonna zoom in, give this friend a little eye. Now, painted turtles have really cool stripes on their face. They have a lot of yellow and white and red stripes. Um, I'm not gonna focus too much on them today just because we're doing mostly um, um, line drawings of these animals. Uh, but feel free, like, especially if you're done with drawing these animals, you can totally go back and color them. Um, or maybe you, were, maybe you were removed and you're already drawing them in color. Um, so we've got our little friend. I'm going to make the burger part go down just a little bit more and then we're going to work on the scoots. Um, so turtle shells. This part's kind of like the spine and that bottom part's kind of like the ribs. So if you think about our body, we have a rib cage with a spine in the back. Um, imagine if your ribs were fused and flat and your spine and your ribs were also fused and flat. That's what a turtle shell is like. It's actually part of their skeleton. The outside's covered in something that's a little bit like our fingernails. Um, so they cannot take off their shells, like in cartoons. Um, there are some turtles that can hide in their shells. Uh, not all the way usually, but they can, you know, this, this turtle has, painted turtles have a good place to suck in their head and fold in their arms and all that jazz. Um, and it's a pretty good defense technique. Um, you know, if you don't want to get eaten by a predator, that any good, any good way to do that uh, is certainly helpful. So for their scoots, um, for painted turtles, they have five scoots that go down the middle. So all I'm going to do is draw four lines. One, two, three, four. I've now separated their back into five sections. And they're kind of shaped like hexagons. So I'm just going to do a little V at the bottom of each one of these. V, V. And then we'll draw the side scoots. And this is like, I'm getting a little, not technical, but I, I really like drawing. I think the first time I learned how to draw like a soccer ball, I was ecstatic just because it's like, I don't know, it's fun. Um, and then painted turtles do have a ridge down their back. So if you were to see one from over um, like an aerial view, you'd see a little, a little line down the middle of those scoots. Um, and you could, you didn't have to get this technical, but I don't know, it's fun. It's like kind of exciting to do. Um, and usually the plaster on, on, the, on the belly has some, has some little lines there too. And uh, I think this friend needs a log because it's a beautiful sunny day and this turtle is sunning itself on the log. And I want to draw you uh, something that I saw last weekend, which is like, I call this turtle bonus, or maybe this is slider on a burger. There's a turtle on the log and then it had 
the tiniest little turtle that had climbed up on top of that turtle's back and I just like lost it. I was like, I thought the frogs on lily pads were good, but then I saw this and I was like, oh, I don't know, maybe new favorite thing. Um, there's something about little turtles that's just, it's, it's cute. I don't know. I just, I can't help it. And this little friend was just like, their sleepy eye. Let's see. Their little Z's for sleep. Um, and chances are that turtle is not the kid of this turtle. Turtle eggs hatch and the kids grow up and they don't know their parents. That's just part of being a turtle. Um, but I'm sure there is value to being a tiny turtle and hanging out with big turtles. Um, you know, kind of like when, uh, I'm trying to remember. So my sister and I are four years apart and I'm trying to remember if there's any times where like she was in like a little kid in like high school, but I guess we didn't overlap. But it's kind of like, you know, hey, you got, a, you got an older sibling who's a high schooler, I'm gonna watch out for you if you're, if you're younger. Um, it's not always the case. I wasn't always the best older sister. I like to think I'm a good older sister now. I was 40, so I've had a while to practice. So our painted turtle friends, um, gonna do one more turtle from the side, or sorry, from the front. And again, with our turtle burger, top bun, bottom bun. And actually, you know, the bottom bun does have this little divot in it to make room for the head. So think about that, that melted cheese spilling over. Um, and part of the reason why I make these like analogies or jokes about this is that they help me remember when I'm drawing. Um, it's kind of like with learning stuff in school where a lot of times I need little um, visual or uh, word wordplay to help me remember uh, what what we were what we were learning. It just helps me learn better that way. So that's why I'm that's why I'm a little silly. But honestly, it does it helps me it helps me remember. So maybe it might help you if you're like. How do I draw a turtle? It's like a burger. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll make that other bun just a little bit. And this friend, this friend either got a little scared or maybe just it was a little cold this morning so it didn't want to come out all the way. So we're gonna draw this turtle with its head a little bit further in its shell. Um, so, and it's from the front. Like I said, animals look a little different when we draw them from the front. And I feel like I haven't actually been keeping track time-wise, but I feel like I, I hope I'm not going too slow. I have two more animals to do after this. Yeah, I think this friend is just waking up. Got two little nostrils here. A little happy turtle friend. I feel like the Bob Ross of ponds today. A little happy turtle friend on a log. Frogs. Oh, I can draw a jumping frog. I was going to do a jumping frog, but that's Maybe we'll come back to the frogs at the end. Um, okay. And then we can do the same thing for our shell. Got little scoots along the outside. And then maybe we can only see uh, two of the scoots from the front. We'll draw them like that. It does kind of feel like drawing a soccer ball almost because soccer balls are uh, hexagons and pentagons. Mixing my burger and my soccer ball. <laughs> A little turtle friend. And if you were to go back in here, there there are a lot of stripes on these friends, especially on their face. Um, so that might be a good time to like, if you want to add stripes, especially if you're doing more color. So our painted turtle friends. Again, some of my favorite, favorite friends to see at the pond. I was thinking of doing a snapping turtle, but we'll just have to save the snapper for another time. Because now it's time for ducks. Um, I wanted to pick a bird that you can find almost anywhere. And I feel like it was one of the first birds that I recognized was a mallard duck. Um, and I just feel like they're, they're everywhere. I think they're, well, they're not completely everywhere, but they're found a lot of places in the world. Um, so mallard ducks. And I feel like they were one of the first birds that I started to learn identification because the male mallards have different coloration than the females. Um, and then there are other reasons like ducklings are cute and I wanna draw ducklings. So sometimes I'm a little self-involved when it comes to what we draw. So duck, body shape. We've got a teardrop shape and then a little, little neck and then kind of another teardrop shape. And I've been trying to get the beak right. I feel like ducks are one of those things that I find hard to draw or just birds in general. Um, I don't know why. It just, they're harder to abstract for me personally than, than other other animals. I find it a lot easier to, to abstract a frog than I 
do a duck. I mean, well, that's not fair. I mean, I feel like I could like, yeah, like there's a duck, but like, that's not, again, it's not, not satisfying enough for me. So some of this is kind of like working backwards and being, okay, what does this duck look like? Um, a lot of it is eye placement. Like depending on where you put the eye can be and ducks have their eyes pretty close in on their beaks. And this is a male mallard. So we're gonna draw the ring. This part would be kind of that shiny bluish green. And then we've got wing stuff. If you've ever like checked out the back half of the mallard, male, male mallard, they have these really cool curly feathers. I don't know if they have them all year round. I know with their breeding plumage, when they're look, trying to look all fancy, they got these just like super cool little curly guys in the back. And that's another thing that I would like accentuate on the bird to be like, okay, a little curly feathers, little, little uh... and then this part is often kind of brown and faded. They've got a lot of color. So this is an, this is an example where I feel like um, using color would also be a really good way to show people that you're drawing this duck. Um, and then we got our feet. Hey, another animal in the pond that has webbed feet is a duck. Um, I didn't mean to do it, but when I was, when I was doing this, I'm like, oh my gosh, almost all of these animals have webbed feet. The, the one exception is the, uh, the dragonfly and they've got the little hooks, which they're good adapted to like land on, uh, you know, plants that are in the pond. We've got our little, draw this one can just be sheeted on the other side. We're gonna draw a female mallard and we'll draw her in the water. Uh, just for the sake, but it's pretty much the same. So teardrop shape that's faced that way, neck up there. You know what, maybe we'll add behavior. Maybe she can be preening. Uh, a lot of birds preen. Uh, it's a way that they keep their feathers uh, in good condition and neat. So if you see a bird preening, I see this a lot with the penguins. The penguins at the aquarium are top-notch preeners. Um, they spend so much time in the water that they, they really wanna keep those feathers in good working order. We'll have this duck have her mouth open. Should be preening her wing feathers. We can have her you know, pulling her wing up like that. Um, one of the cool things on the female ducks is they have like a hidden splash of color. You might look at a female duck and see, you know, they're kind of just like mottled, speckled white and brown, but they have a, a blue flashing on their wing, which I always thought I love the color blue. So I just thought that was so cool as a kid. Um, and one of the reasons why their coloration is very, I don't want to say drab, but think about it. Why would you want to be modeled kind of pale brown and white? The female ducks are maybe a little harder to, harder to spot. They mostly have their nests on the ground. And if she is sitting on a nest of eight to 13 eggs, which is the average amount of, of uh, duck, duckling, duckling eggs that might be there, uh, she wants to have really good camouflage. So. I think it's, I think it's kind of nice, but I'm kind of psyched that she still gets that little like blue pizzazz flash. It's, it's great. Um, so a little preening. Then we'll draw some feet. Wet feet. Do, 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 do. And we can draw that water surface. I mean, one of my other favorite duck in the water positions is this one. When they stick their little duck butts up in the air and you just see them like, in the water uh, looking for food. Uh, mallard ducks are a type of duck called dabbling ducks. So they spend a lot of time in the water looking for food and ducks are, mallard ducks are omnivorous. That means they eat a whole bunch of different plants and animals. So they eat a lot of aquatic vegetation. So plants growing under the water. Uh, they also eat insects and crustaceans and mollusks on those aquatic plants. So think about our dragonfly nymphs. Um, there's freshwater snails crayfish, all sorts of different stuff. And then there's been instances of people seeing ducks eat frogs or other small fish. Um, but it, for the most part, they're gonna go for smaller things that are in the water. And then above water, they will eat some vegetation that's on the ground as well. So if you see ducks on the ground, like looking around in the grass, there's all sorts of stuff for them to eat there as well. Um, I wanted to draw a couple ducklings because if you've been out the ponds recently, you might've noticed uh, there are some duck families out there. So uh, mama duck with a whole bunch of ducklings. And uh, one of the interesting things about ducklings is that uh, I think it's called precocial. When they hatch, they can immediately walk and get into the water. They, they, they're ready to go out the shell, which is really cool. Um, Cause you think about humans, 
we're not that way. I mean, we don't hatch from eggs, but like, you know, a newborn human can't do a whole lot of stuff right out, right out the gate. So it's really fascinating to see animals that are born and just all of a sudden they're like, okay, I'm swimming, cool. Go, go little ducklings. Um, so duckling body shape, um, we do kind of still have that, uh, that teardrop shape, but their relationship with their head to their body is much larger. Uh, this happens sometimes with baby animals. A lot of times their heads, eyes are bigger and a lot of that just allows for, those things are complex, so they need, uh, they need to be big to start with. Uh, but it probably helps a little bit even with survival too. Um, big ass, big eyes, big head. So we'll have our little duckling friend attach that head to the body. Um, maybe we'll make, now they, baby ducklings, have you ever heard them? Do not quack, they peep. They have the cutest little peeps and they'll, uh, they'll peep a lot of times, I think to just uh, let their mom know where they are. Um, so we'll draw this friend peeping. And they usually have a little line through their eye. Peep. Peep, 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 peep. And then got pretty big, pretty big, pretty big little feet. And they've also got web, web feet too, web toes. And a lot of the times you'll see them just in the water. But my favorite, my favorite part about baby ducklings in general is that their wings are just these little tiny T-Rex arms. <laughs> They're tiny. So we're gonna draw some like little tiny, like just a little chicken wing. Like, oh jeepers, that's cute. And they're fluffy. And that's one thing that I didn't actually do very well in this drawing is uh, a lot of times drawing fluffy animals, I'll make sure I get the shape right. And then you can go back in and really make it, make it appear a little bit more fluffy. Um, but yeah, I just got thinking about how they kind of just look like little T-Rexes when they're walking around or little, little tiny duck butts. They're so cute. Um, you know, wiggling their bum a little bit. And they do have, uh, they kind of look like they have camouflage on them, like actual like fatigue camouflage. Um, and they've got, surprise, extra camouflage just to keep them safe from predators. Because um, there's lots of stuff that wants to eat these friends. Like I said, you've got the, you know, the pond's kind of a good example of a, a pretty big ecosystem. So there's things like foxes and raccoons and um, snapping turtles that, that, you know, are predators of these friends. Um, and that's just nature. Um, I will say, there are sometimes animals that are in a pond setting, like dogs, that they're not a natural predator. So if you do know that there's, you know, if you're going into an area where you know there's lots of wildlife, you should have your dog on a leash. It's because you don't want to have your dog like go chase. And the dog might not eat the ducklings, but it might really freak out the mom and the ducklings and be really stressful. So that's part of the responsibility of going into these habitats and making sure that we're, uh, we're good visitors in these places. Okay, got our little tiny duckling friend. And I want to do one more duckling before we move on to our last animal. I want to do a sleeping duckling because I feel like you do see them um, chilling out a whole bunch. And when they sleep, they can kind of compress their compress their bodies into these little little duck nuggets. Just oh gosh, so cute! I can't help it; they're just so darn cute. So, and this one, I I I'm not going to say that I cheated, but I definitely I. I was using my brain. I wasn't talking about the body shapes. I was using my brain just right out the gate to try and draw this duckling. Make sure we get that little tiny T-Rex arm in there. It's a wing. I'm sorry. I know it's not a T-Rex. Well, and we're going to have a visitor. Uh, Gordy. Oh, come on, buddy. I have a cat. He really wants to be right in my face right now. You guys stay, buddy. Nope. Come on. There you can. Big giant orange friend. I know. I know. I'm drawing ducklings and I'm not drawing cats. And he sometimes protests. Why aren't you drawing me? I am the most desirable thing to draw. Okay. We got our duck friend. And the last animal that we're going to do is an animal that I'm relatively newly familiar with because I had never seen them until I lived where I live now and they're muskrats. Um, I yeah I live near a pretty small pond that's kind of behind a bunch of apartment buildings and there's been two I think two families of muskrats living living there. So if you haven't seen a muskrat they're a mammal. Um, they live in ponds. 
they uh i feel like they're not easily confused with a beaver but they are a mammal that swims in fresh water and is sometimes collecting stuff they're a lot smaller than a beaver um but i think they're really fun to watch if you get to see one and a lot of times you'll only just see this so this is the first time i saw a muskrat look like this it looked like the dragonfly at first i promise you it's not the dragonfly nobody i know I'll feed you in a little bit, I promise. So this was the first time I saw a muskrat, it looked like this. And it was creating a bit of a wake um, in the water. They are pretty fast swimmers. Um, well, pretty fast. I feel like, I feel like, I don't know if I'd win in a, win in a swim race with a muskrat. <laughs> um, but they're, the way that they propel, propel, propel themselves forward is mostly in their tail. They have a tail that instead of being flat and pancake like a beaver, it's turned this way and a lot skinnier, but they can move their tail like that to go through the water. They also have webbed hind feet um, and that helps as well, but they mostly use their tail to go forward. So that's what they look like in the water. If you get to see one out of the water, oh jeepers. I know I keep saying like every animal today is cute, but like, oh, it's just the reality. They're pretty darn cute. Um, start with a kind of like a, a gumdrop shape and then we're going to add another little shape up there um, and this is another thing just like with the fuzzy ducklings i'm going to get the shape good and then we'll go back and kind of add some texture to uh let you know that it's it's fur um we've got a little tiny mouth eyes are pretty close in, in the front. Um, they do have little ears. One of them, when I was uh, doing my research today, just about this drawing session, I learned that they can close their ears, like close them up when they go in the water so that they don't get water in their ears, which I think is, is like a great adaptation. I don't like getting water in my ears. Um, but I thought that's so cool. It's like, oh, that's a really neat, really neat adaptation. And they've got little, little arms in the front. And then their legs are often, you don't always see their kind of like knee leg part, um, but they do have these long or webbed or webbed toe feet. Now we can't forget their tail. This is kind of what their tail looks like out of the water. And uh, if you don't see muskrats in person, it's a good idea to look for tracks. So if there's mud, um, They've got little webbed feet. Buddy, come on. I know. I know you want to come just lie right down in front. Um, uh, their tail drags on the ground. So if you see muskrat prints, you can also see a line. Uh, it's one of the best ways to, to find them. So it's all the little paw, all the little paw prints and then the line right now on the bottom. Um, so we've got the, the last little bit of the poofy part. Lay on the side. And then I'm just going to gently erase most of that line. And we're gonna give this friend some really nice floofy fur. Um, all of the animals that we've drawn today live in New England year round, except for the dragonfly. Green darners migrate. So when it gets cold out, they fly all the way to Texas and Mexico, and then they come back. I didn't know. I didn't know that. I was very like super excited about learning that. We do have some dragonflies that do winter over, but for the green darners, they migrate, and that's a long way to fly. Um, so we've got our little muskrat pal, and I think what might be nice is to give this friend a little vegetation. Um, I'm not sure if this muskrat is eating this for fun or if it's taking it to go back and build an underwater den. They build dens and they burrow, burrow like their nests into the ground, but they only make it have a underwater entrance, which I think is ingenious. Um, so they can stay protected against predators. Oh, we should put some whiskers on this front too. And some wiggles. Um, and I think, eh, maybe, you know what, maybe we'll do one more, just kind of quick and draw another muskrat and kind of a slightly different pose. So maybe this one might even be easier because it's a bit of a circle. Um, so I hope 
that this not only inspired you to draw some pond critters, but I hope that if you have a pond or a lake or even like a creek or a stream um, near you, maybe it might encourage you to look at those places in a different, a different way um, to really go and sit and observe. And if you, I mean, if you draw along today, feel free to share your drawings with me on, on social media, but you could also totally go and just draw from life at a pond. Um, I think it's one of the most fun things to do. A lot of the animals that we talked about today are a little bit more active either around dawn or dusk. Um, so the earlier you go out might be, might be better. Um, but honestly, I see muskies, muskrats all, all day long. Um, same thing with dragonflies and frogs and turtles. Get this friend a little. A little. They just, and it's interesting, their, their nose, mouth, and eye are all very concentrated to the right little front of their face. So that's something I'm really kind of paying attention to as I draw the second muskrat. Got more little fur. Maybe this friend's tail is wrapped around a little bit. Um, and one of the things to keep in mind that if you do visit these animals at the pond, that's their home. Um, so be respectful of their home. Uh, don't do anything that would change their behavior. So like if you, if you're close to an animal, even if you're on a path that's like at, at the pond place and you notice that the animal is like starting to get stressed or it's it like knows you're there and it's acting differently, it's probably good to either be quiet or just walk a little bit further down. Um, part of like being a good animal observer is to not, not stress out animals. Um, and kind of be aware that you're a guest in their habitat. Um, same thing goes for not feeding them. They have the food that they need from their habitat. So you try and find them eating, like by observing them, you'll learn a little bit more about what they eat. Um, one of my favorite things to watch eat is the great blue heron. I didn't draw one today because we'll save that for another time. Uh, but great blue herons eat like everything, like snakes, turtles, giant fish. Sometimes they'll eat baby birds. <laughs> um, it's intense, but it's, it's kind of cool because you're seeing nature happen. You're seeing the food web happen and all that stuff. And now I watched a great blue heron eat a snake for 20 minutes. It like shook the snake around until the snake was dead. And then it swallowed the whole thing. I was like, that's like eating a whole thing of spaghetti, like in one go. <laughs> um, and it's just, I don't know. It's like the best. It's so cool. <laughs> it's just like, it's, it's like just down the road. Um, and the same thing applies for any other habitats. If you go to salt marshes or tide pools, um, yeah. It's fun to be a guest in, in animals' habitats, but just make sure that you're being respectful of all the animal friends that are there. Um, so we've got our little musky. I think we're I think we're done with our pond friends for today. Um, if you have favorite animals that live in the pond, feel free to give a shout out to that animal. Um, sorry, I get a no no tardigrades. I thought about going like really tiny for this one. Um, and if you get a chance to go to the aquarium uh, this summer. In the freshwater gallery, there's actually a whole bunch of animals that do live in ponds uh, and lakes and freshwater streams. So you'll get to see a couple other fish and turtles there as well. Not to mention a whole bunch of other awesome animals, but I always like to give a, a shout out to my home, home, hometown animals. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for drawing along. Um, I hope you are having a great spring and continue to have a great summer and are out there uh, observing your fun wildlife and maybe maybe doodling that wildlife so thank you all so much and thanks to the aquarium for having me for these drawing sessions it's always always fun to do so uh see y'all later and gordy's gonna say goodbye too say goodbye gordy we're gonna say goodbye nope he's just gonna sit on my book because that's what cats do okay bye everybody thank you oh yeah oh he's a good little cat oh yeah yeah yeah